Thank you for joining Family Caregiver Alliance for Alzheimer's Disease and Spouse Caregiver Support, How to Keep the Glass Half Full. I'm Calvin Hu, Education Coordinator at FCA and your host. For four decades, FCA has been working across the Bay Area and the nation to improve the well-being of family caregivers. We offer support through consultations, classes, workshops, publications, retreats, research, and advocacy. If you'd like to learn more about us or access our online resource center, FCA Care Journey, please visit caregiver.org. Now for some quick housekeeping. During the webinar, your phones or mics are going to be muted. So if you have any questions, you can ask them by using the chat style question box on your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar. Of course, we also have your questions from the reg registration form. Now, if you do have to leave early, we do archive all our webinars. These can be viewed later on at caregiver.org. Now, we're also going to be asking you to give a little bit of feedback after the webinar ends. We use these to help shape future education programs and, of course, also future webinars. So I'd like to thank you all in advance for filling those out. Today, I'd like to welcome Cynthia Epstein. Cynthia is a clinical social worker with more than 20 years of experience counseling and conducting research testing psychosocial interventions to support family caregivers of people with dementia. She is the co-author of two books, The Alzheimer's Healthcare Handbook and Counseling the Alzheimer's Caregiver. Both of these are available on Amazon.com. She is currently the clinical supervisor at the NYU Langone Alzheimer's Disease and Related Dementias Family Support Program, NYU's of course, NAT, New York University. So now that you know a little bit more about our guest, I'd like to turn things over to Cynthia. Okay, thank you, Calvin, and uh, hello to everybody. So let's get started. Uh, this is a very brief outline of the topics we're going to be covering. We'll do a little bit of background on Alzheimer's, who are the caregivers, some strategies for coping, and some resources that can help you along the way. Okay, next. So what is Alzheimer's disease? Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia. And even though it's so common, it is actually not a part of normal aging. People very often say, but I see all my friends are having memory problems and it's all over the place, but it is an illness. It is not a part of normal aging. And it's a progressive, irreversible neurological disease that at this time has no cure or medical treatment, which doesn't mean that there's nothing you can do to help yourself and the person with dementia, but just not through medical means. Now, this illness affects memory, thinking, judgment, language, problem solving, personality, and movement, with ultimately the person needing complete care in the last stage. However, each person with Alzheimer's is affected slightly differently. And people say, when you've seen one person with Alzheimer's disease, you've seen one person with Alzheimer's disease. Okay, next. So how do we um, identify this, how a person is being affected by Alzheimer's disease? It's by knowing the stages, which have been marked over years of looking at many, many people with the illness and tracking how it unfolds. So now we're pretty clear about the progression of Alzheimer's disease through the stages. Generally, we think of five stages, from mild cognitive impairment to mild or early dementia to moderate to severe. And all these stages have substages so that we can actually get more specific about where a person is in the progression. Now, why is it valuable to know the stage? For a couple of reasons. Originally, it was developed so that researchers could communicate with each other. If they wanted to run a study and they said, I'm working on middle stage patients or early patients, other researchers would know what they were talking about. But for caregivers, it helps to know where a person is in the progression of the illness because it can inform care. If you know where the person is in the progression, you will have some idea about what kinds of help they will need from you. Okay. So how common is Alzheimer's disease? It's very common. 
Today, more than five and a half million Americans have Alzheimer's disease. Over one in three over 85 have Alzheimer's disease, and nearly two thirds are women. And this might be because women live longer. Alzheimer's disease is a very expensive disease, both in cost terms of money, in terms of the cost of care, lost income, in emotional suffering, and all it touches the domains of life in all its respects and all members of the family as well. If you're interested in more specific facts about Alzheimer's disease, you might check with the National Caregiver Alliance or with alzheimers.org slash facts. Okay. Is Alzheimer's preventable? Not really, especially since age is the biggest risk factor. But we can do certain things that will reduce the likelihood of, of dementia. These are lifestyle adjustments. Eating a healthy diet, which would prevent heart disease and diabetes. Getting enough exercise. Staying involved. Reducing isolation and being as full of life as you possibly can be. But yet, there are no guarantees. Okay. Is Alzheimer's disease reversible? No, but there are many causes of dementia, which makes it really important to find out what is causing the dementia of the person you're caring for, because it may be that there is a reversible cause. It might be medication-related, thyroid illness, dehydration, low B12, depression. So it is extremely valuable to learn for sure what is causing the memory problems and other symptoms of the person you're caring for. When you learn the cause of the dementia, you can then prepare yourself for taking on this project of becoming a caregiver. Okay. So who are the caregivers? Family members and friends provide most of the unpaid care for people with dementia. Most of the caregivers, 70% are spouses or partners of the person they're caring for. What is the life like and what is the impact? In general, dementia caregivers report more stress, physical and emotional distress than caregivers for people with other illnesses or with other relationships to the person with the illness. Okay. So what are the challenges that a spouse or partner faces? Well, the main one is the change in their primary relationship. When your partner has dementia, there are changes in the way you can be with each other. There is a loss of companionship, emotional support, practical support, socializing with friends, and of course, future plans may be either modified or have to be given up altogether. In addition, when you become a caregiver for a person with a memory problem, you have to learn new skills, learn to do unfamiliar tasks, and this may cause feelings of anxiety and uncertainty about how able you will be to face these challenges. In addition, there's a lack of time and energy for taking care of yourself, for pursuing your interests, and pursuing your hobbies. But there's another side to the story. Is there an upside to caregiving? Yes. Some people are very gratified by caregiving. They feel they are doing what they can to maintain their sense of being part of a couple. They feel fulfilled. They feel a sense of self-efficacy, satisfaction at doing a good job, fulfilling their vows, giving their partner a good life, and doing for him or her what they feel that he or she would do for you. If you can find the upside to caregiving, the rewarding side of caregiving, probably you will feel less distress and less stress, and the outcomes for you and the person with dementia may be more positive. So consider keeping things in perspective and finding the upside to caregiving. 
In addition, many dementia caregivers are older. They've come through life for many years and experienced many things. And so they can put things in perspective of knowing they've done things before and they can do things now. They can bank on their prior experience to get them through this challenge. Okay. So how does this journey actually begin? Sometimes informally, because dementia, Alzheimer's unfolds slowly over time. So there are those years when you are seeing changes in your partner, when he is just a little confused, gets lost, maybe has a few fender benders, needs a few more reminding, and you start kind of picking up this slack. But it's informal. You're just kind of doing what partners do for each other. But when you get a formal diagnosis, it kind of really says, yes, this is what we're dealing with, and it initiates your formal caregiving journey. Hopefully, your diagnosis will tell you about the stage that the person is experiencing, will suggest any medications, and there are some which may slow the progression of the illness, although not ultimately change its course. And you can learn how to start being a caregiver. Unfortunately, in many of these situations, all the focus is on the person with dementia and not on you, the person who has become or will become a caregiver. Maybe if you're lucky, you'll get a referral to a caregiver support agency, but more often you will be ignored and it will be up to you to reach out for the resources that you need. And fortunately, there are many. Okay. How do people react to this diagnosis in so many different ways? There is a range of reactions, and they also change over time. Initially, even though you may have been expecting the diagnosis, there may be a feeling of shock or denial. I'm not ready to deal with this. Or acceptance. I kind of suspected this is what was going on. If this is what it is, I or we will deal with it. The response of the person who gets the diagnosis also varies and impacts the spouse. Their relationship, their reactions so far may be the same or different. The spouse may be in acceptance and the person with the diagnosis may be in denial. But when either spouse is in denial, they are each left more alone with the reality. More often, it is a person with dementia who denies the diagnosis, and this denial can make providing care more difficult. Okay. So whether you're in denial or in acceptance, you're going to have to tell somebody. Of course, if you're in denial, this will be a more difficult process but certain people need to know about the diagnosis in order to keep you safe and to keep the person with dementia safe. Professionals such as doctors, lawyers, accountants must be informed in order to provide competent service. You need to start planning, getting powers of attorney. And if you can do this while the person is in the early stage of dementia, he or she can participate in the decision-making but also you need people who will understand the limitations of the person with dementia to understand the issues. It is really important to find professionals who are versed in elder care issues about entitlements, about the ability of the person to participate, and finding a doctor who will work with you, the caregiver, is essential. Now, it may be really difficult to make changes and to find a new doctor or a new lawyer but in the long run, it will be well worth your effort. Okay. So what is at the heart of some of this reluctance to accept the diagnosis? They may you know, be like a lot of other people. I have some fears about it, fear of the stigma. Fear of rejection? Will friends stop calling? Will they stop inviting them? And do they really need to tell the children 
They're so busy in their lives, we don't want to upset the children. But the reality is that some connections may be lost because other people may not be comfortable with a person with dementia or with the change in their relationship to you and to that person. But there is an upside. Many new connections can be gained as one enters the world of Alzheimer's disease resources and supports. You will meet many new and wonderful people and even potentially do new and wonderful things. So, how to go about working with this information that you've gotten, the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. There are two coping mechanisms that will really help you through this journey. The first is acceptance. What does that mean? It means being realistic, understanding this is the situation. This is what I have to deal with. It is not about being passive. It is not about just letting this information roll over you. It's about actually being proactive. It means allowing yourself to feel all the feelings that you have, not trying to waste your energy, trying to avoid them, but putting your energy into taking care of what is in front of you. Fighting your feelings will just exhaust you, but engaging in this new world and learning how to cope with the new behaviors, the new situations, all the things you need to learn can be both exciting and gratifying and scary. The other strategy that is essential is asking for support. You can do all of these things when you have support. And asking for support cannot be the easiest thing for many people. There is the feeling, I don't want to do this. Can we move on? I don't want to ask. I don't want to be needy. I don't want people to see me that way. Can we go on to the next slide? Hello? Okay. So people are reluctant. And much of the work that we do at NYU and that we did in our NYU caregiver intervention was to help families, specifically starting with the spouse caregiver, to ask for help. We would bring families together and say, we're here for, to help you, to help each other. So we help families to give emotional support and practical support, and mainly helping caregivers to ask for what they want and to be clear. Caregivers don't like to ask, and they don't want kids in their business. And so they sometimes don't ask children who are very eager to help. So instead of saying to the daughter who comes over in the afternoon with two little kids who are running around to visit her dad, and then dad becomes agitated, and mom stays quiet and grits her teeth, we would help this mom to say, you know, honey, I'm so glad you want to come and spend time with us. It would be better if you came in the morning. This is dad's snapping time. Or whatever it is to help people to be clear in asking for support and accepting support. Both can be learned and you can go beyond your comfort zone perhaps in doing both of these. And when you do get comfortable with asking for support, both you and the person with dementia will do well. Next. Okay, now we're going to look at these two coping mechanisms, support and acceptance through the stages of Alzheimer's disease. How does it look at each point? And it's always good to keep these two in mind. Am I accepting the situation? Am I asking for support? So let's see what you need to do as we move through these stages. And you'll be juggling many things and finding new places in yourself. But if you can become flexible in your acceptance of the change and in asking for support, you are well on your way. Okay. Next. What does the early stage look like? Well, mostly people recognize the early stage through forgetting asking the same question over and over again. Difficulty with problem solving, taking care of the instrumental activities of everyday life, paying bills, taxes, um, 
dealing with the insurance company, all the things that maybe if you had traditional roles and the person with dementia is the husband, that he did in the past. And now you will be doing them. So you will be taking care of the business of life and helping the person with dementia. And sometimes there's a conflict with this person who refuses to give up these tasks and in fact still believes that he or she is able to continue to do them. One of the most difficult challenges of this stage is whether the person with dementia can continue to drive because giving up driving can feel very, very um, emasculating to men and threatening to women. There are some people who've never driven before and now they find that they need to find a way to learn how to drive. And this is especially true in places where there are not good alternative means of transportation. So in this early stage, there's a lot of learning to do new things, coping with the person with dementia's feelings about themselves and the changes that they're going through, and at the same time, maintaining the relationship and not giving up on the things that you like to do. An essential and critical issue, and central issue for the people managing the early stage is balancing autonomy and protection. Family members have different ideas about what the person with dementia should be encouraged to do and when they should not be allowed to do something. This certainly applies to driving, but it can be as much as walking to the corner to buy the newspaper. The son says, mom, let dad go. He's always gone to the corner to buy the newspaper. And she says, but you don't know what it's, wake, what it's like for me waiting to see if he will come back. So these are the kinds of issues that people need to negotiate and some that we could help people with in the family meetings. The use of the cell phone as a GPS has been useful at this stage for keeping track of the person with dementia because when he or she is out and about, you can see where he is, but both people need to have cell phones and they both need to be on. So now we've talked about a lot of the things that change in a difficult way in the early stage, but there are things that don't change and lots of things don't change and Alzheimer's disease does not change quickly. So initially you may make some adjustments like going to the concert in the afternoon instead of in the evening, but you can continue to do many of your regular activities and even add new ones. Walking, swimming, dancing, listening to music, visiting family and friends can continue with small modifications based on the stamina and interests of the couple. <coughs> Excuse me. Now there are many special activities for people in the early stage of dementia, such as museum tours, and choruses and trips and many agencies are hosting programs for people in the early stage and include art photography and yoga for example and when the person with dementia is engaged in these activities the spouse can take a break which is sometimes called respite or many of these activities can be done together at this point either member of the couple could consider joining a support group or seek out counseling, which is covered by Medicare for people in the early stage, as well as for caregivers. Okay, next. The middle stage. The middle stage is quite different from the early stage. The person with dementia is significantly more confused usually, needs more help, more direction, help with hygiene and dressing, even though they may be able to dress themselves. They may be inclined to wear the same thing over and over again or to wear clothes that aren't really appropriate for the setting or for the season. As well, restlessness and agitation may be a symptom in the early stage. This may lead to wandering as the person feels they need to go someplace or do something. Agitation is very, can be very upsetting uh, to the caregiver and strategies for dealing with it. It might include more exercise in, during the day or letting the person walk around more, do more, see what they have in mind, what, what is actually driving this kind of restlessness. Um, medication is really not your first go-to, but if necessary, you may need to do that too. 
Also, enrolling the person in a safe return program or some sort of other program that helps people who uh, go out and get lost potentially as, in addition to the GPS, they may be enrolled in this kind of program, which in fact can find a person who may get lost, uh, which does happen. And there are modifications to the home, which certainly should be made in the early stage to prevent the person from leaving unannounced. At this point, you will have taken on many of the instrumental activities of daily life, and you will be needing to do more physical caregiving. Issues around showering and bathing, I don't want to take a bath, I already took a bath, you have to take a bath. There are many uh, videos and um, illustrations of how to make the battle of the bath more friendly and not, in fact, to get into a battle at all. And I think in the, early, in the middle stage, it's really important to think of these caregiving strategies. You can't rush a person with Alzheimer's disease. You can't argue with a person with Alzheimer's disease. You can't try to convince a person with Alzheimer's disease of what you think they should be doing. And try not to make the person always wrong. People are always telling people with dementia what to do. And they always seem to be doing it wrong. So see if you can kind of do a kindly workaround, and if necessary, be willing to be wrong yourself. And to use, this is maybe a harsh word, the bribe. You know, after we do this, we can do that. After the bath, let's have a cup of tea and cake. Try to be more on the positive side than on the bullying, pushing, and insistent side, and then you won't kick up so much resistance. At this point, sometimes caregivers need to get additional help. They may need to hire help um, or to consider sending the person to a daycare center where the person can meet with other people and have activities to do and have a life of their own apart from the caregiver. And the caregiver can get some respite time and pursue some of their own interests. Again. If you accept what's going on at this stage, you will find plenty of resources to help you. Okay, the late or severe stage requires a lot more physical hands-on care and may be included with incontinence, needing literal help with every activities of daily life, and eventually, at the very end, total physical care. Now, people have said, oh, when he or she becomes incontinent, that's it for me. I don't think I can deal with that. And I can tell you from my years of experience that people can deal with that and do deal with that because you learn how to deal with that. There are incontinence products. There are toileting strategies. There are using different timing methods, um, queuing. So nothing is unmanageable with the right help and the right strategies. Now, where should the care be provided? It is a time when people wonder, can this person remain at home? Is it time to think of a nursing home? I can say that many, many people with dementia are cared for at home across the entire spectrum of the illness, but it's dependent on many variables, the level of their need, physical illnesses, in addition, comorbidities to the dementia, and the stamina and ability of the family caregiver, his or her age, his or her own comorbidities, and the home. Is the home conducive to a safe place for a person with dementia? Um, but making this decision is really a large one that challenges uh, caregivers. But I think it really helped to think about safety. Can this person be treated and cared for safely at home? And is this something that the caregiver and family really wants to do? In our study, there were times when we even recommended nursing home placement because we felt it was the best in, in the best interests of the family. Although those families that worked well together we're often able to keep the person with dementia home for a longer time. But it's an individual decision, very individual, depending on resources, 
emotional, physical, and financial, and beliefs about what is best for the different members of the family, and what kind of medical care you want to be providing. Now, at the end of life, there are many complicated decisions to make, and hopefully they will have been talked about before, and family members will be about the same, on the same page about the kind of end-of-life care that they want to provide. And um, if not, it can get complicated at this point, and people may be willing to use some resources such as hospice, which they may see as a benefit to the entire family in providing palliative care and relief of suffering and other supports. And other people feel it's a kind of giving up, which is really not the case at all. But people have a kind of negative initial reaction to hospice care, which is something that they might get over with further information. Also, the question of feeding tubes. Some people feel that it's essential to do this. Many people in the field feel that it's really just going against nature. If the body is really shutting down and not able to process food, putting in a feeding tube will not really extend life, might not be the most comfortable experience for the person with dementia, and they do not recommend it but some people feel like they're not feeding the person, they can't live with that, that they actually must continue to provide food. Although the research does not suggest that putting in a feeding tube prevents aspiration, which is largely one of the reasons that people think about it, but it's something to think about long and hard because it's a very major decision, although it is easier not to do it than to stop doing it. So it's something to speak to the professionals you value before you get to that stage. So eventually, after this long journey, caregiving does come to an end. And uh, next. And since, um, next slide. Yes. Alzheimer's disease is actually a terminal illness. And if some other illness does not intercede, a person will die of Alzheimer's disease. But it is very likely that something else, such as pneumonia, will intercede, and that will actually lead to the death of the person. And there's a range of feelings that caregivers and families feel when caregiving ends. Sorrow on one end of the spectrum to relief, and commonly a mixture of both feelings. Sometimes when friends or family want to be supportive, they will say to a caregiver, oh, it's glad. it's a good thing that it's over, the suffering is over. But that may not be the way the caregiver is feeling. So no one should assume that a spouse will feel in one particular way or another. So it's good not to just say things like, I'm with you, I know this is maybe a hard time, but not to assume that the caregiver is feeling in one way or another. We did find in our research that the caregivers who had allowed themselves to reach out for support and to accept it fared well throughout the entire course of the illness. And even when the caregiving role ended, they were not depressed, they were sad, they felt sorrow, but they had lived the journey fully and with satisfaction. So in closing, I'd like to encourage you to connect with the many resources now available to dementia caregivers that will enhance and ease your journey. And I want to acknowledge the value and meaning of each caregiver to the life of a person with dementia and hopefully to themselves as well. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks so much. Uh, I really appreciated your um, kind of um, acceptance and support. It's it's two things that are that are not necessarily too hard to remember. Um, we do have some time for questions. Although um, Cynthia, I think um, I was wondering if you could mention the um, the program that uh, you alluded to a little bit that um, caregivers might be able to take advantage of, um, depending on where they uh, live. Yeah. Uh, the NYU Caregiver Intervention is a well-known evidence-based uh, support intervention for spouse caregivers. 
the original study was conducted in person. In other words, the council would meet with the family members in their home or in the office or in some place of convenience for them. We are now offering the same intervention online so that family members who are at a distance and can come to meet at family, come to meet together, can still benefit from having a family meeting and having the input of a social worker, in our case, or a counselor, to help them come together around how they want to be helpful to each other, what they can do and what they can't do. So anybody who is interested in participating in this study, and it is a study we are really testing to see if offering the NYU caregiver intervention online is as effective as offering it in person, and it will be free. So if people are interested, they should feel free to call um, our agency, and I'll give you the number here, which is 646-754-2277, and say that they, you are interested in the NYU caregiver intervention. And it doesn't matter where you live. That is the beauty of doing this online, is that we will find a counselor who is licensed in your area who can work with you around participating in this intervention. So I hope there are those of you who will take advantage of this opportunity. Thank you, Calvin, for reminding me. Perfect. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, Cynthia and I were talking about it last week, so I just wanted to make sure that um, everyone had a chance to, to hear about this kind of exciting um, program that NYU is, is now offering kind of to a national audience. So uh, getting right into questions, the first one, um, you alluded to a little bit in an earlier slide, and it's essentially the kind of role change from from spouse to or husband or wife or um, you know whatever this kind of close um, partnership is to the role of kind of the caregiver you know keeping in mind that maybe people have been assuming a certain situation maybe a certain retirement a certain lifestyle with maybe the grandkids or a nice um, nice retirement after many decades and years of hard work and and you know dedication personal dedication and I was wondering if you might be able to maybe give some advice for someone who might be having a little bit of trouble making that switch from a plan that maybe has been in the back of their head for could could be decades in terms of what what a, a kind of long term living might be with this person who they've married or who they've devoted their life to, but uh, now has changed into this kind of role of, of caregiving and and dementia and, and memory loss. Right. You know, I guess people are so used to talking about the burden of caregiving and all the losses of caregiving, and no one would dare to say that they are not real and true. Dreams are given up. Plans are given up. And that sort of brings us back to acceptance. If you can accept that this is the new reality in relation to the changes that have to be made, you can also create another new reality. How, where can I go with this truth? How can I live a life that is full as a caregiver? Even if you're not doing all the hands-on care, you may be hiring caregivers and having to supervise them. I can tell you maybe the most truthful thing is after having worked with many, many caregivers, it can be done. I want to give people confidence that if you use the resources, if you're true to yourself, if you let people help you, you will find um, compensation for the losses. You may not have the life you are planning, but it doesn't mean that you can't have a life well lived. So I, tell, I, I encourage you to take heart and be open-hearted and flexible. Thank you. Um, Cynthia works with uh, a lot of caregivers, of course. She also facilitates a uh, caregiver support group, so she has kind of, it is not, not an unfamiliar, <laughs> Not an, uh, an unfamiliar question, and, and she's, you know, of course, seen how, how, how people's journeys, you know, how they... Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, I do. But the, the journey of a spouse is certainly different from the journey of an adult child. Both are really significant and bring about different changes. But I think the journey of a spouse is more profoundly impacted by the dementia of the partner. Mm -hmm. We have um, 
Another question about getting back to the different stages of dementia or Alzheimer's, how it, how it might progress. I know you mentioned that when you've met someone with dementia, you've met one person with dementia, but is there are there any kind of, maybe timelines isn't the exact proper term, but... Yeah, there is a progression, and it is fairly well known, although people don't always progress at the same rate. Unfortunately, the end stage is the longest stage. Um, but people are idiosyncratic. Not everybody gets every one of the symptoms in the same way. Some people's personalities change more and they become more jolly and pleasant. Some people become more curmudgeons. So there is a very individual um, way in which the, in, the disease impacts a person. But one of the benefits of knowing the stages is knowing what isn't about Alzheimer's. Not every change that happens to a person with Alzheimer's is related to Alzheimer's. So people tend to jump, oh, if somebody in the early stage um, starts um, becoming incontinent, think, oh my God, now we're in the middle stage. No, when there is a sudden change, the first thing you need to think is medical illness. It's more likely a urinary tract infection than the progression of Alzheimer's disease. So that's just sort of one thing about the stages. I, for me, I think the middle, the early stage can be very trying because the person is so much like his old or herself, and yet there are these limitations and deficits. And if the person with dementia can say, you know, I really can't do this anymore, could you help me? Life can be easier. There can be a little more cooperation. Uh, then if the person is in denial and the food is burned and as one caregiver said today, she came home and there was this plastic bag bonded to the inside of her stove and apparently her husband had tried to heat some food which she had wrapped in, in silver foil and put in a plastic bag and he put the whole thing in the oven. So while the food got heated, so did the plastic bag. And so her reaction was, why did you do that? And of course he said, I didn't do that. Um, so the way you handle these things will also determine how you live this experience. She knew he did it. There was nobody else in the house. But I think here's a really critical point is that people with Alzheimer's are struggling to maintain their self-esteem. And anything we can do to support that will help them to feel better about their lives and more able to be collaborative and cooperative. So while you, she wanted, she did say, I know you did it, there's nobody else here. That didn't go any place, that was very pretty. Um, so if you can get enough support for yourself, you can be more empathic to the frustrations that actually come with Alzheimer's disease, caregiving, yeah. Perfect. Thanks. And thanks for that um, that tip about the medical conditions. It's not something I've ever necessarily heard of before. That's really um, fantastic advice. I think we all realize that dementia and Alzheimer's are brought upon by aging, but of course that also means that a lot a lot of things are going on that are not, as you mentioned, not yeah, not only cognitive. That it just could be a physiological or an illness, as you mentioned. So that's that's really um, great advice for people not to jump 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 too far ahead and, and get necessarily too worried. Um, we have two kind of linked questions about care facilities, nursing homes. Um, one is how you might let the, um, the spouse, the partner, the husband, the wife, um, first of all, how you might determine when the right time to maybe think about a facility might be, and the kind of follow-up question is, if it's determined that it's kind of the right fit for the person and the caregiver, is there a, uh, a way that, that you might be able to ease them into that transition? Yeah, you know, I think we talked about this question before, and I told you I don't have as much experience as I'd like, but I did go around and poll my colleagues here, and we all kind of came up with this perspective Probably the right time 
for any transition to another care facility is when it's the right time for the caregiver. When the caregiver feels that they cannot go on providing care anymore, when it is no longer safe to continue providing care at home, and when there might be more opportunities actually for a better life in a place where there are more people, more activities, perhaps a fuller life for the person with dementia than they were having at home. But I think really the crucial piece is that the caregiver has to be at one with the decision because otherwise that will be communicated to the person. Now, I asked around a bit, and I think the best advice is to ask the place that you're considering transitioning to what kind of process they go through, they suggest for helping a person to adjust. Of course, it will also be very dependent on the stage of the person, their ability to understand why you are doing this and to understand that they're in a different place. On the whole, it is often better to do it Earl on the early side rather on the late side, and yet it feels like no matter when you do it, it's too early or too late. Um, because if you're going, let's say, to an assisted living facility it's, or to a place with more activities, if the person is earlier on, they might be able to engage more and actually find a more fulfilling existence in the new facility. And then the caregiver might hopefully be able to visit, and their relationship might actually improve when some of the stress is reduced, although there's no doubt that when your family member is in a facility, you have a new thing to deal with. They have their rules, they have their ways, and it's another skill set, in a sense, to develop. I did hear from one of my caregivers that the facility his wife is in said, drop her off, say you're going to lunch, and come back in three weeks. I kind of took a breath when I heard that or lost my breath. And I don't know if they have found that the most effective way. I, I was not comfortable with it, but I don't know the best way. And I don't know if there is a best way. There's the best way for the individual with their stage and the family and the place. But that kind of brings up the other thing that I've heard over and over is that people who are at a facility of any kind say, I want to go home. I want to go home. I want to go home. And this really is very hard on caregivers. It kind of breaks their hearts and makes them feel very guilty. But I'd like to remind them that people say this when they are at home. And then the caregiver says, but you are home. We don't really know always what the person means when they say that. Are they thinking of, I want to go home to a place where I felt better, or I want to go home to the place where I grew up, or I don't know where I am and I want to go home. So I think we can help caregivers to deal with this question and it's very painful when you get it, but don't assume you know what it means and that it's literally, I want to go home. People think it might even mean I want to go home to myself when I felt differently. So it's a very almost existential question. Thank you. So it, it really can, um an eventual move to a facility, right, might even be kind of, a, as you mentioned, a win-win for both partners in terms of um, for the caregiver maybe having less lessened um, caregiving responsibilities. Of course, they, they would not necessarily end once they're at the facility, but also for the person even going there, it's not necessarily just wiping your hands of them. It's putting them, as you mentioned, in a situation that that would that might even be a, a better environment for them where they can make, you know, kind of additional friendships and, and it, it might just be a... Um, it could turn out to be a win-win for both for both um, parties. And very often caregivers become friendly with other caregivers in the facility and the kind of a new family forms around the facility, around the visiting, and new supports emerge too. So it can be a very positive experience, of course, if it's a high-quality place. That's essential. Mm -hmm. And sure. there are many lists about how to check on a place, and you should check a lot before you make your decision. Certainly. Um, speaking since just you mentioned list, I have uh, something always in the back of my head. It's Cal um, Canner, California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform. So you just use his initials, C-A-N-H-R, California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform. They have a website, and they actually have a little checklist 
you can print out and download and it's kind of you know all the points you know visit visit at off hours are people in the hallways right. um you know what right. activities are there you know things like that so it's a really nice mm -hmm. um starting point for if you um if there are any listeners who are thinking about maybe making that step how to try and choose a facility that they might feel comfortable in in terms of the, the level right. of care and respect that their um their right. partner and would the be cultural receiving. context Um, one other quick question in terms of uh, just uh, a repeat. I did not write it down, so I'm going to have to ask you again. One of our listeners uh, was wondering what that phone number was for the NYU N uh, intervention. Was. Okay, perfect. And I have a bit of a kind of a large, large topic that maybe you can riff on for a little bit. It's not the, the easiest question, of course, but with a, certainly partners, um, wives and spouses, there's also obviously sexuality and, and int physical intimacy. So um, I was thinking maybe in, in, in kind of this might come to the fore two, two aspects. One, as a couple are living together in maybe the early to late stages, how might you know sexuality and intimacy change as they progress through uh, dementia or Alzheimer's disease? And the other, perhaps um, tricky, tricky scenario mm -hmm. might be when someone, and I, I of course know this happens because I've, I've read about it, and of course we, we all know this happens, but maybe when someone might move to a facility and uh, where their memory is at a point where they might not necessarily remember their spouse very well and might have at that point right. uh, a girlfriend or a boyfriend um, at the facility. Yeah. I think those are very poignant questions, and it, I've even have it right now on one of my caregivers, her, husband, who was a faithful, loving, lovely social worker, actually, began to have an affair, which was totally out of character for him. Uh, and really, it was a function of the illness. So I'm just going to take the second half of your question that first, that people first become less inhibited, perhaps more confused, and in a facility might make a relationship with somebody, whether they know that that's not their wife or is their wife, might not really even be sure about it. And some families get very up in arms and some facilities got very irate and started separating people and we're not going to allow this to happen. And other families think, I'm so glad that this person has found companionship at this point in their lives. So a lot of it depends on your own value system and how you understand the illness. But before you get to that in a facility, Alzheimer's disease does change things about a person's judgment, uh, about their personality, and so the way the kind of loving lover that your uh, family member was when they did not have this illness may change over time. Uh, there is a very poignant uh, video that the Alzheimer's Association made a long time ago in which a husband said that his wife kept coming to him and wanted what seemed like to have sex with him. And he felt that at this point in the progression of the illness, she was really not able to understand what, she, what was happening and that she was sort of too emotionally young. And so he didn't feel it was appropriate to engage in sexual relationships with her and that maybe more cuddling was what she wanted. Um, and I think there was an entire range. Sometimes people become less inhibited and more demanding of sex. And caregivers have felt, I have to say, you know, thanks, you know, that was great. Uh, I don't think I'm ready to start again. Or people, I, I think there is a total range and it may continue as a very gratifying part of life for a very long time. 
or the f changes in cognition um, may alter the quality of the relationship or not, or it may be something that will persist outside of cognition in just an emotional realm in which people can really connect. So I think it's, again, extremely individual and um, depends on what the comfort zone of the couple and their typical habits. That's the best I can say. So as the disease progresses, I think the ability of the person to understand the nature of the interaction will be compromised. Sure, sure. Thank you. Yeah, I've I always kind of have that that question in the back of my head, and it's it's been a, specifically for spousal caregivers. I really wanted to get your kind of expert expert opinion, advice, kind of guidance on this one because I do think it's something that people maybe not. Yeah, I was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I figured if we could, we could we could talk about it, kind of force it out there. Maybe it'll it'll get some additional questions, and maybe people uh, maybe have different thoughts about that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think we're uh, actually just about out of time. Someone did, of course, mention they were uh, curious about the the Canner website again. So I'll just mention it one more time. The uh, it's called California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform. Canner C, actually I should write that down. C A N H R, and um, it's uh, just a little fact sheet, a uh, kind of um, sheet you can take with you if you're visiting a nursing home. It's not California specific, so anyone who might be interested could refer refer to that resource. It's it's a, it's more of a general kind of you know trying to figure out if if it's a good facility, if it's well staffed, if it's you know if they have the right kind of uh, culture and, and kind of um, if it's if it might be a good fit, but anyways, I just wanted to. Um, someone mentioned uh, if I, if I could mention uh, that that name again. It's very long, so often people can't. Uh... Along those lines, you know, Medicaid is a big issue in terms of Alzheimer's care, and it is the only long-term payer. So I mean, that's a whole other discussion that people need to think about how to fund the care. And uh, we didn't really talk about Medicaid, but I just learned of a resource called I Can that I think is in New York, can help people to learn how to get on Medicaid, as can, um, sometimes you need an elder care attorney, and sometimes a social service agency can help. You know, I feel like there's so much to say. <laughs> uh, but I guess we just have to stop at some point. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, we're, we're out of time. I think we're about 3 o'clock on the East Coast. I do want to mention, though, I'm going to bring it back to the previous slide, that if you, um, if you weren't able to get your question answered, we do apologize. But if you see at the bottom of the screen that's Cynthia's email, uh, feel free to email her with your questions. Of course, you can also call um, Family Caregiver Alliance. Uh, we work specifically with San Francisco Bay Area caregivers on a one-on-one -on -one kind of in-person basis, but we're happy to provide information and uh, referrals to local resources. If you have any questions for um, on kind of a national level, if you're calling from outside of the San Francisco Bay Area. But anyways, I think that's um, all the time we have for today. I'd like to thank um, Cynthia for uh, being with us this afternoon. We do appreciate her time uh, calling in from Manhattan. Um, FCA webinars are a free and continuing series. You can find more information on our next webinar on our website, caregiver.org. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Cynthia, for joining us. Thank you, everybody, for being here. <laughs> the, web <laughs> the webinar is now concluded. We hope to see you all for the next one, and have a great afternoon.